All right, good morning, everybody. Today we're going to cover the five periods of American political history as it relates to journalism and kind of the changes in media coverage of politics um, that have happened over American history. So this will be a very short lecture today. Um, so we'll, we'll, we'll have you in here for about 10 minutes. Um, and then there's an assignment that's gonna be due next Tuesday. So out on my website, um, there's the media bias assignment. So what I'm gonna ask you to do there is to pick a topic and to look at coverage of that topic in a variety of different uh, news sources and to, and to kind of look to see where you have bias, where you can kind of identify uh, differential coverage of a topic um, to see where different news sources may have different spins on the same issue. So we'll kind of look at that. So that'll be due on Tuesday of next week. Um, it needs to be two pages double spaced um, in terms of uh, what you submit to me. So you can obviously submit that to me on Google Word or Google Docs, I'm sorry. Um, and, and get that to me uh, by next Tuesday. All right, now, in American history, we, we can kind of break up journalism into five different eras. So the first is what we call the party press. <clears throat> um, we'll talk about that here briefly in a second. Um, let me go into the popular press period, magazines of opinion, electronic journalism, which was the longest, um, or right around the longest, and then we have the internet. So we'll kind of walk through these five different periods in history, what each one of those looks like. Now, the party press period was roughly the first, you know, 40, 50 years of our country's history. So going up to about the 1830s, and in early American history, the political parties themselves published newspapers. So the media in this country was state-run newspapers. So there was no private ownership of press, anything like that. Um, we had these small-scale newspapers that were distributed to just just a small group of people. Um, and the point, point of the newspaper was to push different political viewpoints. Now, early on, this was Federalist versus Anti-Federalist. Um, then as we moved into the Jefferson era, so we have kind of the beginning of the Jeff Jeffersonian um, era, and we kind of see kind of the shift into this one-party system for a little bit um, that eventually ends with the split with Andrew Jackson into the Democrats and... Um, so the Democratic Republicans basically falling apart. So we have Jacksonian Democrats, Whigs, all of these other things there. <clears throat> but the party press period um, really was very different in that there was no private media covering government events. The information that people got was the information that government wants them to get. So that is basically what we consider to be almost like a communist system today. So if you look at the government of uh, North Korea or something like that, that's what you would see there. So the government publishes the news sources, the people hear what the government wants them to hear. Uh, journalists were on the government payroll, very government centric. Also during that time period, we did not have mass publications of newspapers. We couldn't mass produce papers the way we could today. So the papers were printed and were distributed on a very small scale to just a handful of people um, locally. Um, and that was a very different era. Okay. We then move into the 1830s um, up until about 1910. We go into what we call the popular press period. And the popular press kind of had two phases. Um, the popular press period started when we started to have technology that allowed us to mass produce newspapers. So now we have, not only do we have a printing press, because we'd had that before, but now we had the ability to print hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of newspapers in a short period of time. So now I could distribute papers to a lot more people. Now, in 1840, the telegraph became much more prevalent in the United States after its invention. That allowed communication of events going on in Washington, D.C. to other areas of the country. Because before that, you could most news was local news because you couldn't get information from one place to another. Uh, very rarely was there world news because you really didn't know what was going on in other countries just because of communication barriers. 1848. To kind of address some of this issue, we have the creation of what's known as the Associated Press. And the Associated Press is still out there today. And they're a significant factor about how newspapers and even websites cover issues today. The Associated Press basically took different reporters and they stationed them all around the world. And when an event would happen, let's say in Germany, or an event would happen in Brazil or something like that, somebody who worked for the Associated Press in those countries would write a story about it, and they wouldn't sign their name to it. They would say that this story was written by the Associated Press, and they would put that story out there for anybody. So all of these newspapers that existed around the country 
would have the ability to pick up Associated Press stories. They would pay a fee, and they would be able to use Associated Press stories to show people locally what was happening all around the country. So today, if you are around the world, today, if you look at the Dayton Daily News, they still run a bunch of Associated Press stories. We don't have reporters from the Dayton Daily News in California um, stationed all over the world. They pick up uh, Associated Press stories and they run them. So this allowed people to not only see, no longer were we seeing necessarily what the parties wanted you to see. Now we were getting kind of this unbiased, true media coverage of things that were going on all over the world. So the AP was important. In 1860s, we started to see a lot of densely populated cities. We started to see cities now that had a million people living in them. And what that allowed us to do is to mass produce papers and to get them to people who are clustered very closely together. And that allowed us to kind of uh, just kind of change the way that we distributed the papers and it allowed us to kind of hit a, hit a wider audience with, with, with our news. Now, as we move into the late 1800s, we start to see some of these rivalries um, between people and cities. So by the time we get into the late 1800s, most powerful newspaper publishers, now we had private ownership of the media and we had freedom of the press as established in the First, First Amendment. And now most cities had multiple newspapers. So in Dayton at one time, we had three different newspapers in Dayton. Dayton Daily News won that, that battle between the three of them to still exist today. Uh, but we had a lot of different newspapers. So during this time, we started to see these newspapers start to run stories that were designed to draw an audience. So last year in American history, you probably covered yellow journalism. Um, this is kind of an example of that. Uh, the press was trying to sell papers. It was kind of trying to do what media tries to do today, is that you, you have an audience, you've got to pay your bills, you've got to sell papers. So um, William Randolph Hearst, who was one of the famous uh, newspaper publishers during this time, um, during the Spanish-American War, m famously made a comment that if you furnish the pictures, I'll furnish the war. Basically, if you take pictures of what's happening during the Spanish-American War, I will write stories in a way to kind of make Americans believe whatever I want them to believe. And that's kind of the view of the media today, depending upon the news sources you watch. And this is why that bias assignment is going to be uh, pretty important for you to see, is that depending upon the, the, the news source you, you pay attention to, you can get a very different perspective on a story. Um, and during the yellow journalism period, we saw how exciting scandals and wars were to the American people. We wanted to hear about scandals. We wanted to hear about all of these things that we weren't used to hearing about in our daily lives. Now, moving into the early 1910s, now we're kind of into the progressive era. And during the progressive era, the popular press still continued to exist. But we started to see some people who kind of turned away from yellow journalism. We didn't want to talk about yellow journalism anymore. We wanted to talk about how government's changing. We wanted to talk about how things are going to run more smoothly in government. What are the good things that are happening? Civil service reform. Um, how We don't want to hear scandals. We want to hear what government's doing to help us. So we saw the creation of what we called magazines of opinion. And, and some of these still exist today. Um, Harper's Weekly, The Atlantic Monthly, none of you have probably read any of these. Uh, but these were, these were magazines that basically covered public policy issues and the things that government were, was doing to help people, not the scandals that were going on in government, but what are some of the good things government does to help us. So we still had the popular press. We still had these multiple newspapers competing in each city, but then we had these magazines of opinion that started to emerge as well. So now there were a lot of places to get news from. We didn't yet have TV or radio, but there were a lot of different publications that were out there um, as we moved into the early 1900s um, that allowed people to get information. Then we move into the 1930s, and we see the, the beginning of the electronic journalism movement. Now, some politicians were very quick to see the importance of this new media. Other politicians were very slow. We used the example earlier this year of Richard Nixon during that 1960 debate against JFK, the first debate that, that appeared on television, and Nixon didn't prepare for that at all. He came on TV all old and sweaty and um, looked like he was pale and nervous, and JFK had makeup on and, and looked like he was prepared for television. He was prepared for that new media um, that existed. Nixon wasn't. Now, 
The key to electronic journalism or what made it different was that now politicians could speak directly to the people without counting on somebody else to write the story. So during the last hundred years, you were counting on some media, um, some mag newspaper editor or whatever the case may be to write a story that was favorable to you. Now you get to control the message. You get to speak directly to the American people, whether it be on TV, whether it be on the radio, whatever the case may be. Um, you could talk directly to them. And it really benefited politicians who were skilled enough to use it. So um, during the late night, radio really became prevalent in the 1920s. Uh, when we got into the 1930s, FDR made wide use of this with what were known as the fireside chats. So during the Great, during the great Depression um, and leading into the beginning of uh, U.S. involvement in World War II, um, FDR talked directly to the American people. So we had these, these radio addresses, which were called the fireside chats. People would sit around um, the, the fire and listen to FDR talk to them. Television really started to pick up in the U.S. in the late 1940s. It wasn't until um, middle of the 50s that, that a lot of American households started to have TVs. First televised debate wasn't until 1960. So that was, again, a little bit slow to um, advance. But again, new journalism started to pop up. Now, uh, during this time, uh, many cities still had um, newspapers, but the number of newspapers they had started to decline. As we moved into the 1950s and 60s, usually most cities were left with one newspaper. So some company won out and they were able to beat everybody else and they were able to kind of take over control of that market. Now, there were still some cities, Chicago, New York, LA, that had multiple newspapers. By the time we got to then, the Dayton Daily News had won out. They were it in Dayton. And while people could ignore um, oftentimes what appeared in, in a newspaper, now we had these TV stations that were struggling to get um, to, to, to fill coverage. And there was a lot easier for people to get information out that they could kind of watch on their own time whenever they wanted information. Now, we didn't have the 24-hour news networks yet, but most TV stations had news on in the morning, news on at noon, news in the afternoon, um, news in the evening. So there were a lot of different chances and, and sources of information that people could get. So you might be able to ignore a, a story in the paper, but once we had more things on TV, it was easier to communicate. Um, today, um, with the 24-hour news networks, it's very easy for a politician to get on TV. Prior to the 24-hour news networks, which really didn't take off until the 1990s, it was a lot harder. They would cover the president. They would maybe cover um, the Speaker of the House or the Leader of the Senate. But they wouldn't talk to every, every single politician like they do today. If you turn on... 24-hour news network, you're going to see a bunch of different politicians talking. Today, you don't have that. Or I'm sorry, back then you didn't have that because they didn't have the time. You had these 30-minute news broadcasts, and that's all the, all the time you really had to cover. Up until the 1990s, the big three networks, ABC, CBS, NBC, controlled over 80% of the news market. So um, most people got their sources from those networks. That is definitely not the case today. Um, what politicians started to realize, too, is because these networks were, had these 30-minute broadcasts or trying to cram in as much as possible, they would edit a lot of presidential speeches down to like seven seconds. So it used to be longer clips, 40 seconds of a speech or something like that. Now it was seven seconds. So you never knew when you were a politician what part of your speech was going to appear. It could have been something profound you said. It could have been something stupid that you said. Um, you just had no idea what was going to appear because you were at the mercy of these uh, TV stations who, who could really publish whatever they wanted to. Hey, um, today, obviously, it's much, much easier for politicians to get their message across. It's easy to get on TV. You've got these 24-hour news networks, Sunday morning talk shows, Meet the Press, Face the Nation, um, all of those things which are out there on Sunday morning. Um, even our entertainment programs, Entertainment Tonight, things like that, you see politicians appear on there all the time. Uh, the morning news programs, Good Morning America, to the Today Show, politicians are on there. Um, and then what we call primetime news magazines. So that would be things like 60 Minutes and Dateline and things like that. Politicians appear on those as well. So today, there are many, many chances for politicians to speak directly to the American people. What's contributed to, well, I'm sorry, what, an effect of the growth of all those 24-hour news networks is that nightly news viewership has plummeted in the U.S. So to, and by 2012, only 22% of Americans watched those nightly news programs at 6.30. In 1980, that it was over half of all Americans. So that was a significant change um, from, from 1980 to 2012. Uh, most people who want to run for president, um, they will want to appear on as many of those programs as possible. So um, since president is always on TV, the easiest way to attack, to get, to get news coverage, 
is to attack the president. And we saw that um, Ted Cruz, Marco Rubio, Rand Paul, all of them hoping to run for president in 2016. They all attacked Obama constantly um, from 2012 to 2016 because it got them it got them on TV. It got them that face time with the American people. Um, here's the kind of a chart that kind of shows you the decline, as I talked about. And it's been a steady decline for the most part in the percentage of Americans watching these nightly news programs. Now, since 2005, a big uh, thing in politics has been the Internet. Um, <clears throat> more than half of Americans today... Um, get information about elections online. Um, 2010 was the first time in which we had the majority of Americans getting information online. Um, that was not a presidential election, that was a congressional election, but yet a lot of Americans uh, getting their news sources there. Um, blogs, obviously, very, very popular. Um, we have conservative and liberal blogs, which are pretty significant, um, where we get information out about different sources. Um, obviously, social media, most politicians today have a Facebook or a Twitter or some way to speak directly to the American people. Uh, but the thing, obviously, as you all know very well from uh, being teenagers, is that uh, the fact that you don't have to identify yourself all, oftentimes on social media, anonymity makes people a lot more aggressive. You are much more likely to say something online than you are to say something to somebody's face. So um, anonymity makes people more aggressive. It really changes the political discourse in this country because of that. The internet also makes it much, much easier to raise money. Today, it's very easy for politicians to raise money, uh, taking advantage of these direct solicitations. Much easier for people to organize and attend meetings. Oftentimes, meetings will be online. Um, op opinion polls, oftentimes done. If you go out to somebody's Twitter account, you might see a poll that's up there. Obviously, those are unreliable polls. They're not good data, but they're something that people throw out there, and they'll oftentimes use them if they benefit them, those results. It allows you to instantly criticize your opponent. Uh, this really started during Obama's presidency, but Republicans, um, when Obama was president, would sit in the House and Senate chambers during his, during his State of the Union address and would directly just be tweeting things directly as he said them, um, either negative or positive things about what he said. Um, so you could criticize your opponent almost immediately when they said something. So the internet has changed that significantly. Obviously, it makes it easier to mobilize your followers locally and then target people um, for campaigns who can help you. Um, who's somebody who might be able to donate money? Who's somebody who might be able to uh, run campaign ads for me? Things like that. The Internet has changed that significantly. But the big thing the Internet has changed is how most Americans get their information. No longer is it, is it directly through a media source. Oftentimes today they get information directly from a candidate or from a politician. Now that can be good or bad. Okay, The media, even though we know that there's some inaccuracy sometimes in the media, oftentimes the media is held to some degree of journalistic ethics um, where individual politicians can say really whatever they want and oftentimes can't be held to any sort of um, um, credibility uh, based upon what they say. Okay. All right, so that's kind of the five stages of American journalistic history. So we go through these five periods, um, and it really kind of shows um, how technology has changed the way we think about um, different things. Okay. Now, uh, no writing prompt today. Um, so today, I just want you to get started on the assignment, the media bias assignment, which is out on my website. Um, that is going to be due to me on Tuesday of next week, so please have that to me by Tuesday, by the by midnight on Tuesday night. Um, a reminder, the other thing you need to be focusing on is your binder check, so your binder is due next Friday, so that's going to be chapter 12, three pages from chapter 12, front and back, and then chapters 17, 18, and 19, one page front and back from each. I would focus on vocab from those three chapters. Hope everybody has a good day, and I will talk to you on Monday.